story that's so outlandish, so ridiculous, it was just too hard to believe. I'm not talking about Bigfoot or the Loch Ness Monster. I'm talking about real life situations that were so peculiar, it made you think there is no way that could be true. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. In March of 2018, Business Insider carried a feature article about a company named DipTech. And DipTech is a French-based organization that makes very expensive candles. In fact, these candles are so expensive that the average cost can be anywhere between $65 to $315 for one candle. Well, last year, DipTech released a new candle scent that was just too hard for me to believe. The French-based company said that their new candle would smell like New York City. Now, when, when I read that, I thought, come on, seriously? A candle, like, like what's it going to smell like? Pollution, right? A sweaty cab driver on a hot summer day? But even though it was just too hard for me to believe, it turned out to be true. Because last year, their New York scented candle hit the market with a price tag of $72 per candle. And unbelievably, they sold out in less than a week. But you know, that story just reminded me that we live in a culture where we constantly see things that are just too hard to believe. And the truth is, we aren't the only ones who felt that way. Because all throughout history, there have been countless men and women who saw things that they never would have believed could have come true. Because no one in the 1920s would have believed that anybody could break a four-minute mile until Roger Bannister did it. Nobody in the 1940s would have imagined that there would come a day when a man would actually walk on the moon. And nobody in my generation, nobody who's 40 and up would have ever thought that there would come a day when you could pick up a mobile device and have a conversation with somebody who lived halfway around the world. That would have seemed impossible. But you know, if there was any event in human history that had to be just too hard to believe, it was the events that unfolded that first Easter morning. Because when Jesus came back from the grave, nobody, not even Jesus' disciples, believed it could have been true. And it's easy to understand why they felt that way. Because the disciples had a front row seat to the arrest and crucifixion of Jesus. And they honestly thought that nobody, not even Jesus, could come back from something like that. But this morning, this morning we're going to look at a section of scripture that's going to make you sit back in your seat and wonder. Because what we're going to do is we're going to look and we're going to see how Jesus reacted to the very people who didn't believe that he came back from the grave. And when you see what really happened, when you see what Jesus said, you are going to be shocked. And do you know why this section of scripture is so important? It's important because there are so many people in our culture today who think the very same thing. And they're not bad, they're not horrible. They're just living in a place where they wonder, is this whole event of Jesus coming back from the grave even believable? Is it even possible? But what you're going to see today is that isn't a new thought. Because on that very first Easter morning, everyone in the pages of Scripture felt the very same way that so many of us feel. And you're going to see that when they got it, when they understood it, it changed everything. Now, in order for this section of scripture to make sense, I actually need to do something that I've never done before. I need to walk you through some very specific details of Jesus's arrest and crucifixion. And I don't want to do this for shock value. Because some of the details of this story are very graphic. 
the reason I want you to see what really happened is because I want you to understand why the resurrection of Jesus was so hard for the people to believe. Just a few days before Jesus was crucified, he and his disciples went to the city of Jerusalem for the Passover celebration. And not long after they got to town, Jesus was arrested by the Jewish leaders for crimes that he never committed. They accused him of subverting the nation of Israel and that he opposed the payment of taxes to Caesar, but that wasn't true. In fact, every one of those charges were completely false, but the religious leaders were willing to do anything to make those allegations stick. So what they did was they arrested Jesus in the middle of the night and they brought him before the Sanhedrin, the ruling body of 71 elders for a mock trial. And during this trial, these religious leaders allowed some of the most sinister behavior you could possibly imagine. Look at what the Bible says about that in Matthew 26. It says the chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for false evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death. But they did not find any, though many false witnesses came forward. Now, don't miss what the Bible said there. Because Scripture makes it very clear that there was no evidence whatsoever that Jesus had done anything wrong. But the religious leaders didn't care. They hated Jesus so much, they wanted him to pay the ultimate price. They wanted his life. But there was a problem. The Jewish leaders knew they couldn't execute Jesus on their own because that was illegal. They had to get permission from Rome. So they took Jesus to Pontius Pilate, who was the governor of Judea. Luke 23, 1 says, Then the whole assembly, that means all the Sanhedrin, they rose, led Jesus off to Pilate, and they began to accuse him, saying, We have found this man subverting our nation. He opposes the payment of taxes and to Caesar and claims to be a king. In other words, they said, Pilate, this man is a criminal. He's been causing trouble all over Palestine. He opposes the payment of taxes and he even claims to be a king. If you don't take care of this situation, if you don't deal with him, you are no friend of Caesar because we know there is only one king and that is Caesar Augustus. Now, the odd thing is, even though they accused Jesus of every crime you could imagine, Pilate thought he was innocent. That's why verse 13 says, Pilate called together the chief priests, the rulers, and the people and said to them, you brought me this man as one who was inciting the people to rebellion. I have examined him in your presence and have found no basis for your charges against him. But when Pilate resisted, the louder their voices became. And verse 23 says, but with loud shouts, they insistently demanded that Jesus be crucified and their shouts prevailed. So Pilate decided to grant their demand. For some reason, and I don't know why, for some reason, Pilate just couldn't stand the pressure of leadership because he knew, he knew that if the people started to riot, he would have to explain what happened to the emperor. So in order to alleviate that conflict, he just gave into the crowd and he handed Jesus over to be crucified. Now, I don't know if the majority of people in American culture really understand what it means to be crucified because I didn't. In fact, when I was in seminary, I'd read the story of Jesus countless times, but I never really understood what it meant to be crucified until a professor explained it in class. You see, crucifixion was the most dreaded form of punishment in the ancient world, and the Romans were experts at this method of execution. You see, they didn't just take a person, stick them on the cross, and watch them die. No, the Romans had a systematic process that they would follow whenever someone was sentenced to this form of death. The first thing that they would do is they would have the condemned person 
flogged, which is a form of punishment all of its own. In fact, flogging is so graphic and so gory, I'm not even going to take the time to explain it. But the reason they would start off the crucifixion process by having somebody flogged is because it would weaken their body to a state just near collapse or death. Then, after they were flogged, the victim would be forced to carry their own crossbar to the execution site. Now, this crossbar weighed anywhere from 75 to 125 pounds. And what would happen is the soldiers would take the crossbeam, put it on their neck, put their arms over the crossbeam, and they would tie their arms right around the form. They would tie it to the crossbar. And after they tied their arms, the soldiers would lead the victim through the city toward the execution site. But as they walked through town, one of the soldiers would hold a sign out in front of them that had the condemned man's name and their crime. Now, the place where Jesus was crucified was called Golgotha. It was also known as the place of the skull. And the reason they called it the place of the skull was because there were some very peculiar markings in the mountain just below the execution site that looked like this. But Jesus wasn't crucified there. He was actually crucified right above those strange markings on a hillside out of the city gates. And do you know why they did these executions outside of the city gates? It's because they were far too graphic to happen within the city walls. So the soldiers would carry out all of these death sentences outside of the gates. Well, after they reached the crucifixion site, what would happen is the victim would be placed on the ground. The soldiers would make sure the arms around their forms were tight. Then they would open up the victim's hands and they would drive nails right through the center, which would cause an unspeakable amount of pain in the median nerve. But after both arms were fixed to the cross, the soldiers would lift that crossbar off the ground and they would secure it to an upright post. Then, after they secured that post, what the soldiers would do is they would bend the victim's legs and they would nail their feet to the cross. Now, the reason that they would bend their legs before they attached the nails was because the Romans were experts at torture. You see, if a person's legs were bent, all of the pressure of your body weight would be pulling down on the nails that were driven in your hands, but that wasn't all it did. The pressure of your body weight pulling down would separate your arm sockets, your ribs. It would stretch your body in such a way that it made it almost impossible to breathe. But there was a way to take a breath if you could stand the pain. In order to take a breath, the condemned would have to push up on the nails in their feet and the pain would have been horrifying. That's why most people who died from crucifixion died by asphyxiation because they slowly suffocated to death. In fact, if the soldiers wanted to speed the process along, what they would do is they would take a club, walk up to the cross, and they would break the condemned man's legs. Because once I break your, break your legs, you can't push up anymore. Well, after the soldiers nailed Jesus' feet to the cross, what happens next was this. They took the sign that had his name and his crime, and they attached it above his head. Verse 38 says this. There was a notice written above him which read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. And you have to understand, crucifixion was not just about physical pain. It was also about emotional distress. Because after the soldiers would fasten someone to a cross, they would often taunt and make fun of the very people they were crucifying. That's why verse 35 says this. The people stood watching, 
and the rulers sneered at him. They said, he saved others. Let him save himself. I mean, if he is God's Messiah, the chosen one, the soldiers also came up and mocked him. Crucifixion wasn't just a death sentence. It was a form of agony and humiliation that most people could never imagine. And after several hours of unspeakable pain, the Bible tells us that Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. And when he said this, he breathed his last. But after Jesus died, Scripture tells us that Joseph of Arimathea went to Pilate and he asked for Jesus' body and Pilate agreed. So Joseph of Arimathea took Jesus' body, wrapped it in linen cloth, and the Bible tells us that he laid him in a tomb. But on the first day of the week, some women went to the tomb to put some spices on Jesus' body, but when they got there, the stone had been rolled away, and when they entered the grave, Jesus' body wasn't there. And I want you to see what happens in Luke 24, 4. It says, while they were wondering about this, which means, where's the body? While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. And when the women heard that Jesus had come back from the grave, They raced out of that tomb and went back into town to tell the disciples what was going on. And verse 9 says, When they told all these things to the disciples and to all the others, but they did not believe the women because their words seemed like nonsense. And don't blow past that verse. Because in this section of Scripture, we learn the most amazing thing. We learned that when Jesus came back from the grave, his own disciples didn't believe it. These were the very same men who watched Jesus turn water into wine, walk on water, feed 5,000. But when the women came and said Jesus came back from the grave, they're like, there's no way. Nobody could have come back from that. We saw what they did to him. We saw him flogged. We saw the nails. We watched him die. There is no way that anybody, not even Jesus, could come back from something like that. And because they were in a state of total denial, Jesus does the most compassionate thing. Look what happened in verse 36. It says, while they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them. Now, could you imagine? Could you imagine the look on their faces? They had to be scared to death, and they were, which is why verse 37 says, the disciples were startled and frightened. And do you know why I think they were so afraid? I honestly believe that they were scared to death because they thought that Jesus would have been mad at them. Because when Jesus was arrested, every man in that room ran away and denied that they ever even knew who he was. So they had to think, when they saw him again, that there was some big punishment coming in their direction. But it's in this section of scripture that we learn something very unusual about the character of Jesus. Because instead of the disciples getting what they deserved, they got something completely different. Verse 44 says, Then Jesus said, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. Now, if you're somebody who sits here this morning and you wonder, what was Jesus really like? I mean, how did he really treat people who'd made mistakes? You don't have to look any further than this verse. Because when Jesus showed up that first Easter morning, 
he could have given the disciples the lecture of their life. He could have told them how bad they were, how disappointed he was, and that there was no hope of heaven for anybody in that room. But that's not what Jesus did. Because there was no lecture, no punishment. The Bible tells us that Jesus loved them so much that he opened up their minds so they could understand the truth for themselves. Jesus just looked at them and said, look, you have to understand, I went through this for you. Because God knew from the very beginning of time that all our sin, all of our mistakes and our brokenness separate us from God. And he sent me to the cross. He sent me through what you saw so that every one of you in this room and every person on planet earth for all time could be forgiven and have the hope of eternal life. And when those words came out of Jesus' mouth, the disciples must have thought, I can't believe that. I can't believe that not only did you came back from the grave, but I can't believe that you did all of that for us but it was true. And because Jesus took the time to explain it, it didn't just change their life. It has changed so many people throughout the course of human history. I don't know how many of you have ever heard the name Nabil Qureshi, but Nabil was born in Pakistan and his parents immigrated to America when he was just a child. And when Nabil's family moved to the States, they were completely dedicated to the Islamic faith. They followed all the customs, all the rituals. So Nabil grew up believing that the teachings of Muhammad were real. But Nabil wasn't just a follower of Islam. He was also brilliant. In fact, he was so smart that after he graduated from college, he immediately went to medical school. And after three years of training... Nabil was at the top of his medical class. But it just so happened that during his last year of medical school, Nabil got a new roommate whose name was David Wood. And David was different because David was somebody who really believed that Jesus was God's son. And over the course of several months, David and Nabil became good friends. But one day, one day, David challenged Nabil to do something he'd never done. He said, you know what I'd love for you to do? I'd love for you to read the Bible for yourself. Because David really thought that somebody as smart as Nabil, if he just understood the truth of God's love, it would change his entire life. But when, he, when David suggested to Nabil that he should read the Bible, it made him angry. Because the thought... I mean, Nabil just like, there's just like the whole thought of this Jesus thing and him coming back from the grave, it's nonsense. There's no way that could be true. So what Nabil did was without his roommate knowing, he bought a Bible and he started to read it for himself. But the more Nabil read the Bible, the more disturbed he got because every time he read about Jesus's love for people, it would just inspire him to learn more. Now, many Muslims believe that God reveals himself through dreams. So what Nabil did was he was reading the Bible one day, he just closed his eyes and he started praying a very unusual prayer. He started praying, God, listen, you don't, I don't buy into all this stuff. I don't even think that you're real. I think this is nonsense, but if you are real, if there really is something to this, would you just reveal it to me in a dream? Prayed this prayer for weeks. And one night, Nabil had a very vivid dream. He dreamed that he was standing in a hallway. And in this hallway, there was a really narrow door. The door was so small that Nabil had to bend down just to see what was inside of it. And when Nabil knelt down, 
he looked through this opening and what he saw was he saw this huge table with all kinds of food on it. I mean, turkey and ham and dressing and potatoes, just tons of food. And sitting at this table was his roommate and a bunch of their friends. And as the beer was looking at these, they're, like, they're all sitting there. What are they doing? They're not eating. Why aren't they eating? It doesn't make sense. And Nabil woke up in the middle of the night and he had no idea what this dream meant. So a few days later, he couldn't get this off his mind. So he said to his roommate, he's like, hey, Dave, I had a really weird dream. It doesn't make a lot of sense. And I'm not saying you're like this interpreter, but I had this dream. Does this make any sense to you? And he goes, I had this dream that there was a narrow door and a table and you guys were sitting there and it just, it doesn't make any sense. And David goes, Nabil, that dream is really easy to understand. Jesus is the narrow door. The banquet is the kingdom of God. And the reason we're not eating is because we're waiting for you. And when those words came out of David's mouth, the people's like, is that true? Is that true? Is this what God is using at this moment in my life to make an impact on me? And even though at one point of his life, the whole Jesus story was too hard for him to believe, Nabil Karishi ended up giving his life to Christ and that one decision changed everything. Because after he gave his life to Christ and was baptized, he went on to write one of the best-selling books in years. It's a book called Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus. And the funny part about Nabil's story is, we all know people who feel that way. They're not bad. They're not horrible. They're just at a place in their life where they wonder, I'm not sure I believe this. I'm not sure I buy in, just not sure. Because there's a part of me, that even though I really wouldn't say this, part of me thinks this whole religion and God thing is just something for weak-minded people to do on Sundays where they kind of go to church, they kind of lean on their faith as a crutch because they want to be forgiven for all the things that they've done wrong. But I'm just not sure that I believe this is true. If you're somebody who sits here today and you kind of think that and they guilted you to be here because it's Easter and we're going out to eat after church, here's what I want you to know. You are not alone. Because all throughout the pages of Scripture, there are people who felt the very same way as you did. And my challenge to those of you who kind of feel that way today, my challenge to you is this. Would you be willing? For great if this was your whole life, but would you be willing to do the very same thing that the disciples did? the very same thing that Nabil Karishi did. Would you be willing to investigate the truth for yourself? Because here next week at Velocity and for the next seven weeks, we're gonna unpack a section of scripture that when you see what really happened, you'll be like, no way, that's even, I can't believe it's that simple. I can't believe it's that easy. But what you're gonna see over the next several weeks is that Jesus made understanding who he was and following him easier than you could possibly imagine. And I hope that if you're somebody who feels that way, you would be willing to make an investment in you. Let me pray for us. God, I I love the, the story of the resurrection because we've all felt that way. Even though we may never say it, There's a part of us in the back of our mind where we wonder, okay, is this the reality? Could this really have happened? And the thing that I love most about what Jesus did is he did two things. He showed up and gave them evidence, but secondly, He opened up the disciples' minds so they really could understand the truth. And God, my prayer for all of us this morning, for every person, whether they believe or don't, my prayer is the same. Would you allow all of us to open up our minds so that we really can take deeper steps to understand who you really are and what you really did? But secondly, would you do for us
the same things that you did for the disciples. Would you show up in our heart, in our lives, and lead us to a place that we always wanted to be? Because at the end of the day, what most people really want is we just want to understand the truth. And God, would you help each and every one of us get to that place? We want you to know how much we love you and we thank you for Jesus. In his name we pray, amen.